Top 10, top I got a top 10, 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10 Gotta learn from the wise women and men Need motivation? Watch the top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something greater inside you as well. You've got Michael Jordan level talent at something. So get ready to be brave, be passionate, and believe with Casey Neistat in my take on his top 10 rules of success, volume five, to give you the belief that you need. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, find your passion. I do a 20 hour day at least five days a week, if not six days a week. Yep. Um, and there's usually a day where I'll sleep, I'll sleep in and get six or seven hours. And I have a three year old at home. Uh, and I think that especially in the world of YouTube with sort of the, the buzzwords and the platitudes and the, the inspirational quotes of working hard. Um, I'm part of this. I sell a sweatshirt that literally says work harder on it. Um, <laughs> it's easy to romanticize hard work, but the reality of hard work is that it's, it is what it is and it sucks and it's nonstop. There is no off switch. Um, and, and, you know, like I've, I don't need to work hard. Mm -hmm. Like we could leave New, expensive New York City and move somewhere more cost effective, and I can do nothing but watch TV for the rest of my life. And I can say that at age 37, and that's a huge privilege. Um, but instead, I work 20 hours a day because I love every second of it. Uh, you know, when I was, I took a year where I was not focused on YouTube, I was focused on a company, and it was a more regular schedule. I was miserable. I was, it took away my sense of self, it was my, it's my sense of purpose. And that's why I preface my whole talk by saying if you find that passion, you're extraordinarily lucky. Because um, to do that, uh, digging ditches or washing dishes, which is what I did early in my career, it really sucks. But when you love doing it, there's no disassociating your work from your life, your identity, from who you are. Rule number two, believe. When I first moved to New York City, I lived in an SRO, like a, a single room occupancy. It was a, it was a place that had no bathroom and no kitchen. It was a shared bathroom. Not a great place to live. And I used to ride my bike almost every day, like from where I worked all the way downtown, all the way uptown, with this huge heavy bag with like all my camera gear in it. And, and this camera gear was like this burden. It was like this weight. I knew that that burden on my back was going to be what set me free, like what all my dreams could come true if I just believed in this thing. Rule number three, know how to brand and market. We spoke to the creator and the, the person who's maybe looking to work on their personal brand and stuff. On the flip side, there are a lot of old school brands um, that have sort of like a dinosaur mentality when it comes to social media oh, yeah. and, and new school marketing and you being one of the disruptors in that area, you know, you've mentioned, uh, you mentioned <laughs> in your keynote Nike and, and how you weren't even wearing anything that was Nike. That's amazing. Um, what, what sort of message do you have to the guys at the top, let's say, that are scared to evolve and they're hesitating because they're used to what works for them? I mean, look, I think Nike is the, Nike has one of the strongest brands in the world because they're willing to take chances sure. on a video like that. And the reason why someone like myself works well with a, Nike, a company like Nike is because like, it's about an ethos as much as it's about a product. Um, which is to say that it's very little about the product. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think Apple computers, like their commercials are never about their products or yeah, their products features. So they're about an idea. And my philosophy on branding and marketing as a whole is like, if you sell the idea, people will invariably buy the product. Um, so um, all the marketing that I do is always about ideas. It's never about products. Rule number four, stand out from the crowd. How do you break through on YouTube or should you bother? Um, I mean, my rule is always the same. It's like, if you're doing what everybody else is doing, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking to what makes other people successful and thinking you can emulate that, you will never, ever, ever find success in a platform like YouTube. Um, why would somebody possibly take the carbon copy when they can have the original? So I think it requires a truly inventive kind of thinking. And then just brute force. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, if in the days of television it was one episode a week or, um, you know, movies a couple times a year, I think on YouTube, like, there's such a litany of content that to really be heard and develop a relationship with your audience, you have to constantly be putting co fresh content in front of them. 
So I think if you combine those two ideas, like originality and your creativity and then just total brute force Mm -hmm. um, uh, and hard work, that gives you the best odds. And I see those as as not paths to success, but prerequisites for success. By doing both of those things, doesn't mean you'll be successful, but without doing them, there's no way you'll be successful. Also, if you want to have more confidence, check out my 254 series. It's free. The link to join is in the description below. Skill I use is probably communication, which I think is building on on what Gary said. I think communication is is a two-way street. Rule number five, be unreasonable. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. I am an unreasonable man. Rule number six, work hard and be brave. The generic advice I always give to young people is that the two things you need to do to find success in the world, no matter what it is you want to do, is you need to work hard and be brave. If you're willing to work harder than the next guy, and you're willing to take chances that the next guy is not willing to take, you will find success. Rule number seven, be realistic. And I'm super cynical and jaded about YouTube success, which is um, contradictory to so much of what I share, which is that it is true that it's a fair and open egalitarian meritocracy. It's, everybody has the same entry point. Um, a 12-year-old kid who's here today signs up for an account the same way that somebody like me signed up for an account when I started mine and I had my own show on HBO. It's the same. So the entry point is the same for everyone, but success is extraordinarily elusive. So when you think of what it might be to be successful on YouTube and you see the YouTube stars with their sweet Yeezys and their Lambos, realize that success on that platform is, is less likely than succeeding as a musician. Do you want to be the next Katy Perry because your chances of succeeding there are the same as they are or less or more so than they are on YouTube? Do you want to be a professional athlete? It's the same kind of thing. Um, and I think there is this misconception that because the entry point is an egalitarian one, because it's a fair one, that success is also fair or more accessible, and it's not. It's not. There are one billion accounts on YouTube. If you're trying to be a YouTube star, there are one billion people in some capacity trying to do that the same. So I, I would always caution just how gnarly of an uphill battle it is. Mm-hmm. And it's also impossible to predict success. You can look at channels that are making incredible content being all, and say all I have to do is make incredible content. The ones that throw me off are the channels that make garbage content, and they're killing it. And it's like, what does this person know oh, that God. I don't... The unwrapping of eggs. You have kids, right? <laughs> there's, I have for, a kid. There's nobody the in this audience under the age of six. <laughs> egg unwrapping videos. Literally a plastic egg that gets unwrapped. There's a t- 500 million views on those videos. Yes. <laughs> and my daughter watches them. So, so no, I mean, the advice I would have is don't do it. Um, and if you can... If you accept that advice, then you're making the right decision. If you refuse that advice, then like know that it is a, a battle like no other battle, and it requires a level of commitment that, um, that I think most, most people, including myself, were naive to until they're okay. in the throes of it. Rule number eight, say yes to things. In 2003, after that video exploded, it opened all kinds of doors for me in places that I, I couldn't have really imagined. Um, in Some interesting places, some weird places, some... Some, uh, some opportunities that didn't make a lot of sense. I, I, I was hired by like a public access, like a very, very small cable news network, to, to cable television network to make some local content for them. I didn't know what any of that meant. I just said yes because a good rule of thumb earlier in your career is just keep saying yes until they hand you the check. Um, and that's what I did. Rule number nine, seize opportunities. When I was young, my, the dream was always to be a more traditional filmmaker to make feature films, to work in television, to, you know, to, to, to be a part of what I understood media to be, you know, when I was a teenager. And then I just think, you know, I was very, I'm very lucky to be born at an opportune time. So as technology really shifted and disrupted what, what media is and what it's come to represent, I think uh, all, all I saw in that was sort of opportunity to, to be a part of whatever's next. And, you know, after being a traditional filmmaker for a number of years and working in television for a couple of years, it's when I really got excited about what could happen on the internet and the power of things like, whether it's YouTube or other social media outlets, when you share video there, it, it's a very different relationship than when you watch content in a, in a cinema, or watch a movie in a cinema. And it got me excited in a way that I, I don't think I could have ever imagined. And that's kind of what pulled me out of the traditional space in media and 
really fixed me more in the, the new media landscape. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is don't let failure stop you. Deciding to make that iPod movie, which was really stupid and not a great movie, that was one of these defining moments. And when that guy, his name's Tom Scott, he's a brilliant entrepreneur, when he turned to me and said, is there something bigger you want to do? That was one of those moments. And what we pitched him was this. It was like, hey, why don't you just bankroll us, cover all of our expenses for a year, and let us make a bunch of little movies? Is, not, is that not the dream right there. Um, but he seemed amenable. I mean, this is a guy who was offering us a huge opportunity after we had done nothing but delivered on something that was nothing like what he hired us for. So it was like, maybe I want to take a chance. And he said, sure, let's do it. By the way, him bankrolling us for a year was, was very, very little amount of money. It was literally just enough so we wouldn't have to worry about rent. We're not talking about millions of dollars here. It was something small. And what we did then, what we did then was all we knew how to do, which was make these tiny little movies. And this is 2007. But now in 2018, I would describe them as essentially YouTube movies. Like, that's what we were doing. But we didn't know what they were. It was just the only thing we knew how to do. So we made these little videos. And he would come once a month and check on us just to make sure we weren't completely blowing off this huge deal that we made with him. And he loved the content. And about six months in, he walked into our office with this, like, very smart, big deal movie producer. And it was, it was like, nerve-wracking. Her name was Christine Vachon, by the way. She's an Oscar award-winning producer. She's an incredible, just, like, brilliant mind in the world. And she watched the content. I remember she, like, didn't say anything, which is, like, the worst thing somebody can do. You know, if somebody's like, oh, this sucks. You're like, maybe I'll try harder. And if somebody's like, this is great. You're like, yeah, high five. Like that. Um, but if someone says nothing, nothing is the scariest thing. And she said nothing. And then when it was over, she turned and looked at us and she goes, I think that that was very good. But wait, wait, wait. Let's respect. She didn't say, I think that was very good. She said, I think that that was very good. Like, like she wasn't, it was more like, what the hell did I just watch? <laughs> And she came back to us and she gave us this piece of advice. She was like, take all of those little movies and figure out how to put them together in a consumable way. Like, make it so you can actually watch them. And we're like, okay. So that's exactly what we did. We took all these little pieces of a movie. We made them 20 minutes long. We put an intro at the beginning and we put credits at the end. And then we were like, this is now a TV show. <laughs> um, you, you laugh. And so did every single TV network we brought it to. Um, I remember one network was like, if you don't find anywhere else to put it, we'll put it on our website. And that was like the most painful thing to hear. It was like, ugh, defeat. But that woman, Christine Vachon, she showed it to HBO. And I remember her calling and we were like, hey, how'd the meeting go? And she said they liked it. And I just remember, I was like, she's a restrained woman. That has to mean something. They liked it. And at the end, HBO bought that show for like a couple million dollars. And that was like the big break. That was our big success. Don't applaud. That was our big success. You guys weren't going to applaud anyways. But we had done it. Like, that was it. That was the victory. It was 2008. Like, climb on top of the mountaintop. Like, we did it. Um, and then nothing happened. Like, they sat on the show for two years. And when it finally aired two years later, they played it on a Friday night at midnight. Can you imagine what this audio size would be like if my videos were only watchable at midnight on Friday nights? It'd be me and that guy with the phone. That's it. <laughs> just, just the two of us. Um, and, and it was. It was a failure. Like, it got cool reviews. People were like, this is an interesting concept. No one watched it. Um, and that was crushing. That was heartbreaking. And it was in the ashes of that that I was like, you know, I'm just going to do this on YouTube. I'm just going to do this on YouTube. And I think the ultimate irony is that if you go back and you watch my HBO series, um, you'll see it feels and looks exactly like the content that I now call a vlog, the content that does 2 million views a day every single day. It's the same thing. Now I've got a special bonus clip from Casey on how to build a relationship with your audience that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the three point landing questions. Let's go from just watching a video to taking action. Here we go. Question number one, what failure will you not let stop you? Number two, What's the thing in front of you that you just need to say yes to? And number three, what will you do this week to stand out from the crowd? If you're gonna take some immediate action, I also wanna see you give me a hashtag believe down in the comments below. I uploaded videos monthly for, for years. I had over 100 million views on my channel, 100,000, 150,000 subs, or it might have been hundreds of thousands. It was a successful channel mm -hmm. by all means. Um, but the first time someone ever asked me for a selfie uh, was, was five days after uploading the, the, uh, or starting the vlog. Uh, 
Okay. It was five episodes into that. And I can tell you now, 800 episodes later, that people on YouTube don't subscribe to content. And I think there's a lot of truth with a campaign uh, as well mm-hmm. in this. People subscribe to individuals. And no matter how good my videos were, no matter how viral they went, it was just a video. And until I made the vlog, which was squarely about me, um, people didn't know what or who they were identifying with. So uh, my biggest learning of the community, or when I first realized what, the, what it meant to have a community around content, is that it's about a relationship that I have. That's not true. I don't have that relationship. It's a relationship <laughs> that 9 million people have with me. Yeah. Um, and, and I try my best to communicate back and make it a, a, a two-way street. But it's challenging, it's, it's unique, and there's very little precedent for it. So it's, um, it, you learn as you go. If you want to see the first top 10 rules I did on Casey, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. I don't really like the word inspiration. Uh, I like the word motivation. It's not how you tell it, it's what you tell. I always do my best to operate without fear.